And I wrote him a note. And I said, you know, when, when, he, when, when his name was nominated, I wrote him a note and I said, you know, introducing myself as the U.S. attorney from the Southern District. And I said, you know, uh, Mr. Barr, you're just what the doctor ordered. And boy, was I wrong about that. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, September 20th, 2022. Jeffrey Berman was the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York in the Trump administration. He was appointed under peculiar circumstances, and he was fired under even more peculiar circumstances. He is now a partner at the law firm of Freed Frank, and he is the author of the new book, Holding the Line, Inside the Nation's Preeminent U.S. Attorney's Office and Its Battle with the Trump Justice Department. He joined me in the virtual jungle studio to discuss the book's shocking revelations of political interference in the Southern District's work by Bill Barr, by Donald Trump, and by others in the Justice Department. We talked about the pattern of political interference. We talked about the relationship between it and more famous cases. We talked about the efforts by senior Justice Department officials to shift gears after the 2020 election. And we talked about whether this is a story of fragility in the U.S. Attorney's Office or strength. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 20th, Jeffrey Berman on Holding the Line. So I want to start uh, with the question that I think literally everybody who I've mentioned your book to has asked me, which is, why did he take until now to, to tell this story? Uh, this seems like it would have been super valuable information to the electorate in the months between the time of his firing and the time of the 2020 election. People are varying degrees of cynical about this. So I, I just want to start by, by, you know, asking you why now? Sure. I'm happy to answer that. You know, there are laws and regulations of the Department of Justice that prohibit DOJ employees and former employees from talking about any investigations or cases or conversations with other DOJ employees. And so when I was at the Department of Justice, uh, I uh, uh, you know, strictly adhered to those rules and laws and as a former employee, I was bound by them as well, and I adhered to them. And so what happened after I was fired, I was asked to testify before Congress a couple weeks later. And I went to the ethics officer of the Southern District of New York, and I said, what am I permitted to talk about? Uh, and, and he said, you could talk about your last two days. You can talk about your conversations with Bill Barr. You cannot talk about any investigations or any cases or any communications with Department of Justice employees. And then I took that guidance to Maine Justice and spoke to their ethics officer, and it was confirmed. And those were the parameters of what I was allowed to talk about under law and under regulation. I took that to the committee. And I said, these are the parameters that I was given. Is that okay? Meaning, you know, do you still want to hear from me? And they said, yes. And so when I testified in the committee, I put all that on the record and it's public testimony. And so that's why the details described in the book about specific investigations, specific cases, and specific conversations with other Department of Justice employees I could not include in my congressional testimony, and in order to get it uh, publicly, uh, allow me to publicly speak about them, I was informed by our ethics officer that I had to go through DOJ pre-publication review. There's a department in the, uh, uh, within the DOJ that does exclusively this, 
and any present or former employee of the Department of Justice submits whatever they want to publicly release, and it's reviewed and vetted. And that's the process I, I went through. But let, just let me point out, <laughs> I did not go quietly, all right? What I could say about what was going on at the Department of Justice, I did say. So you may recall when um, Bill Barr uh, sent out a press release on June 19, 2020, that said that I was stepping down and that a outsider, a person from outside the Southern District of New York, who was trusted by Bill Barr, was going to take over the Southern District of New York as acting U.S. attorney. I was about as noisy as I could be within the restrictions of the DOJ guidelines about what was going on. You'll recall I sent out my own press release that was uh, it, it told the country that the chief law enforcement officer of the United States lied when he said I was stepping down. I had no intention of stepping down. And I invoked the language of the obstruction of justice statute when I talked about his behavior. So I let everybody know that. It was no secret. And then when I testified before Congress, I told them that it would have disrupted and delayed our critical investigations if Barr was successful in putting in an acting United States attorney from outside of our office. And if I had not gone very public and very noisy with my opposition, that's exactly what would have happened. The Southern District would have been taken over by an outsider, but because I was so loud and so noisy, uh, my successor, Barr, backed off, and, and my successor was my deputy, Audrey Strauss, who was a person of unparalleled integrity. So I went through the process. I have never violated any department guidelines or laws. I submitted my book for publication, pre-publication review, it was vetted. I was allowed to release it, and I did. So this was really the first, just to circle back to the original question, this is really the first opportunity that you ever had to tell the story other than by sort of going rogue. Is that fair? That's very fair. I want to talk about your portrait of Bill Barr. You have something of a uh, similar relationship with that you describe in the book, only much more up close than than I do, frankly, which is a certain being pleased at his appointment uh, for many of the same reasons that I wrote in public that I was pleased by his appointment, being then completely shocked by his behavior, and then a certain disgust at the way in which he has sought to rehabilitate his image in the post-election period. Uh, and you describe a pattern of behavior by him with respect to SDNY investigations that is pretty consistent across a variety of, of areas. And so I'm interested just for your kind of reflection on how we should understand the totality of Bill Barr's attorney generalship. What part institutionalist, conservative uh, ideologue may be, but guy with principles who will not let Trump steal an election? And what part hatchet man for, for Trump is he? Well, I have to tell you that uh, I think you and I mirrored each other from beginning to end on this with uh, respect to uh, Bill Barr, because as I relate in the book, um, you know, I was an AUSA. Bill Barr signed my certificate as a, an AUSA in the early 90s at the Southern District of New York. And when I heard that he was replacing Matt Whitaker, who was acting attorney general, you know, I, I was thrilled. <laughs> Naively. I was thrilled because I thought exactly that. Here is a, you know, kind of an old school Republican, George H.W. Bush era, an institutionalist. And I wrote him a note and I said, you know, 
when when he when when his name was nominated, I wrote him a note and I said, uh, you know, introducing myself as the U.S. Attorney from the Southern District, and I said, you know, uh, Mr. Barr, you're just what the doctor ordered. And boy, was I wrong about that, uh, because as soon as he came in, the pressure, the political pressure and interference with the Southern District of New York was pretty much nonstop. It had gone on before uh, Barr uh, became attorney general, but you know it accelerated uh, once Barr was in. And it was really outrageous, and it was unprecedented. We've had people in the office for 40 years who had never seen this kind of thing going on. So at the end, and, and you know he's gone on his book and uh, revisionist history tour. And um, you know, I, I, I think that you know, I, I wanted people to understand, and which is why I wrote the book, the full extent of his improper and outrageous interference with the Southern District of New York. And, you know, his book doesn't mention a single one of these interferences. No, and it, do, and it doesn't mention either. I mean, it mentions the frictions with line prosecutors and the Mueller team, but it doesn't mention any of the frictions that that you describe in which they, you know, he was very much reaching down in uh, in prosecutions without, you know, very much reaching down into individual prosecutions and sort of directing how briefs should be written. Uh, all kinds of things that you don't, you really think of as the U.S. attorney's role, not not Maine Justice's role. Well, you think of it because it is. <laughs> Maine Justice has never micro tried to micromanage the Southern District's cases like Bill Barr did, and so his book doesn't mention John Kerry, it doesn't mention Greg Craig, it doesn't mention Cohen, it doesn't mention Hawkbank. It doesn't mention Ukraine, and it doesn't mention my firing. Imagine, imagine writing a book about your experiences and whitewashing all of the improper, intrusive things that you did and, ha- and instructed the Department of Justice to do under you. So help me out. It sounds like like you come down very heavily on the side of Barr was a political actor doing the president's bidding using the powers of federal law enforcement. And you describe in the book repeatedly kind of trying to navigate that and a real awareness that that was the operating environment. How then should we understand his activity after the election? Was it the the president just pushed him too far? Was it that he had a change of heart? How, how do you understand the flip from the Bill Barr who is sarcastic and demanding and uh, results driven in repeated instances with you with the Bill Barr who, for example, testified before the January 6th committee? I think when we examine whether people followed their oaths in the Trump administration, that examination should be done prior to November of 2020. After the election and after Trump laws, I think a lot of people re-examined what was in their personal self-interest. And so after the election and after Trump lost, Barr and others scurried off the ship. But before the election, as you say, he was doing the bidding of the president and he undermined the rule of law and corrupted the Department of Justice. All right. So let's go back to the the original appointment of Jeffrey Berman. And I will confess that I was one of the people who was like, he sounds like a good guy, but he met with the president and uh, I wouldn't confirm anybody who met with the president after what happened to Preet. I'm curious whether in retrospect, you think I and Senator Gillibrand uh, and the others who kind of took that view were wrong or whether in light of what happened to you, we should say, actually, 
that was the right standard, but we lucked out and we got the the president and company screwed up and they 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 chose a you know a genuine institutionalist in this case being SDNY and so we kind of lucked out we were we were wrong but for the right reasons how should we think about your original appointment in retrospect well the first thing is i have to say thank you because you and Senator Gillibrand actually did me a great favor because had I been uh, nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate, I wouldn't have actually ended up having the protections that I did and enjoyed while in the office. You know, I was uh, appointed under a statute that provides that the attorney general appoints a, an interim U.S. attorney for a period of four months, which will be followed by a decision by the judges of the district of, they can select anyone to become the you know, permanent United States attorney. And, and I was, I'm thankful that the judges uh, appointed me uh, to that position for an indefinite term. So in my mind, that gave me additional powers because uh, I couldn't be fired by the attorney general. And I didn't even think I could be fired by the president. I thought it required the judges who appointed me to fire me or if a candidate was nominated and confirmed, obviously I would, I would resign under that situation as, as the statute provided. So, you know, I ended up uh, being able to f fulfill my duties a little better because I had a little more insulation politically. As far as meeting with the president, you know, I really don't think that should be a disqualification for me or anyone else or going forward anyone else. Presidents appoint people all the time to prosecutorial posts where they know that person very well. They may have gone to law school with the person. There is no prohibition to someone being appointed as a prosecutor by a president. You know, there's, there's no uh, prohibition if the president knows that person. So I, I, I didn't see it as disqualifying uh, at the time, but, uh, you know, I ended up being the beneficiary of it. So... One of the things that I found very striking about your book, and you you announce at the beginning that you're going to do this, is that you mingle together the cases in which SDNY is handling as a matter of routine within, uh, without interference, and then these sudden instances of uh, political and main justice interference. And thus, though you never really say it, kind of contrast the way the system is supposed to work with the way it functionally worked. Um, I'm interested in what percentage of the office's work product that was, you know, not wholly routine was affected by, you know, the sort of overlay of, of, I'm just going to say it bluntly, corruption at the department. Was it something you were dealing with every day? Is it a tiny fraction of cases? How often were you looking over your shoulder at Bill Barr and Donald Trump? Well, one of the reasons I decided to go forward with a book is it because it allowed me to put in every instance of attempted interference and deal with it on a granular, factual way, which I think makes it compelling. So, you know, when you look at any one of these attempts at interference, it's, it's you know, deeply troubling. But when you look at them all together, as we do in the book, it takes on an entirely different uh, and more ominous threat. And so I felt the book was the way to go on that. And as far as the productivity of the SDNY. I mean, it's just phenomenal. I mean, when you say, oh, apart from the, uh, the, you know, the typical cases, I mean, the Southern District of New York handled so many extraordinary, unusual cases and did it so well. You know, it's hard for me to give a percentage of the cases. I, I mean, uh, it ultimately was only a small fraction of the cases that where we, you know, where there was an attempt to politically influence and that those were the cases you know, that involved the political enemies of the president or the political friends of the president. And luckily, the Southern District of New York 
was handling, you know, a huge number of cases that didn't involve those people. And so we didn't have to deal with Bill Barr or anyone else on those cases. So you describe yourself at the beginning of the book as a member of the endangered Rockefeller Republican uh, species and uh, somebody who was sort of fooled by uh, Donald Trump, uh, whom you thought of as likely to be transactional in the good sense, but you really thought the, the madman pose was an act. I'm curious, and you say you're, you candidly say you'll be the first to say it, you were completely wrong, much as you, uh, you and I both say about, about Bill Barr. I'm curious how you regard yourself now. So you've come off of this searing experience of uh, supporting and then being nominated for by uh, a president who is a, a, a turns out to be a lawless man and and having this set of harrowing experiences uh trying to do your job under a sort of luminary of the conservative bar who turns out to be as you describe a sort of political hatchet man for for Trump are you at this point a sort of disaffected republican are you just are you just an SDNY guy? How would you describe your own migration politically and philosophically in response to this experience? Well, you know, as you say, um, you know, I am a kind of very centrist Republican, have been my entire life, and I'm not walking away from the Republican Party. I, I have faith that leaders will emerge that res who respect the rule of law and want to instill faith in our critical institutions. And, you know, I was in a non-political job and my problems with Trump and my problems with Barr are non-political. They're about the corruption of the Department of Justice, the erosion of the rule of law, and turning the Department of Justice, making it, making what should be an independent and unbiased department into one that where it did the biddings of the president. So those are non-political issues that I think both sides of the aisle should be able to agree on. You describe in passing in the book, um, you mention some of the other instances where Barr reached down into the bureaucracy to affect individual cases, particularly the cases that arose out of the Mueller investigation. Uh, you don't describe your judgment of them, them being not matters that you worked on, but the clear implication is that you see them as part of the same pattern of interference uh, that you experienced. Is that fair? Do you it's completely like when we, fair? You hit it when we look head. at Mike Flynn and uh, Roger Stone, should we see that in the same light? Absolutely, Ben. You know, one thing about Barr, he lacked a certain imagination, and he always went back to the same playbook. So, for example, um, I had you know when Jesse Liu uh, moved from U.S. Attorney in D.C to take the job in treasury. She was pushed out. She didn't want to go, but she was told you're either going to take the job in treasury or you're going to be fired. Okay. That's exactly what Barr said to me when I met at his suite at the Pierre hotel on June 19, 2020. And what did he do in DC? The U S attorney took another job and he placed not the first assistant, which is the normal process. He put in an outsider, Tim Shea, his close ally and advisor, to run the office. And then it became a hostile takeover by main justice of the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. And that's exactly what he planned to do in the Southern District of New York. And I pointed all of this out. I connected the dots explicitly in my congressional testimony. It was It's there for the 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 public could so easily see what was going on because as soon as Shea got in there, as you said, the fi different filings were made in Flynn and Manafort and AUSAs resigned from the cases and one resigned from the department completely. And of course, what was Barr's reaction to those resignations? 
he couldn't care less. He gave that Hillsdale college speech where he said that career prosecutors, he compared career prosecutors at in the Department of Justice to Montessori preschoolers. That's his disdain for the hardworking men and women in the U.S. attorney's offices. So I want to ask you about the Hulk Bank case, because in, in some ways uh, it is in some ways, it's the most shocking of the cases, though, uh, at least to me. And, and the reason is that there's a direct line between Donald Trump's interpersonal relationship with uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the pressure that you guys were getting. That is, when Trump is courting Erdogan and they, they as Trump would famously say, get along, you guys are under relentless pressure not to bring a case against this Turkish bank that had conspired to violate uh, sanctions against Iran. But as that relationship sours, all of a sudden you're green lighted to prosecute it. And I was thinking, okay, there is a role for foreign affairs to affect prosecutorial judgments. And I'm thinking here about the decision in the, the famous illegals case under, under your predecessor. Uh, you know, Obama decided to trade prisoners for, to trade the defendants for, for uh, spies held by the Russians and kind of nixed the, nixed the criminal case. And so I, I want to just push you a little bit. It feels these feel to me to be entirely different, but I'm not sure how formally different they are. And is the difference here that Trump was kind of acting in his personal interest? Is the difference that one seems seems merited and fits into a long pattern of spy exchanges and the other doesn't? Like, when is it okay for the president or main justice, for that matter, to say, Hey, there are compelling foreign policy reasons for SDNY not to get its way on this one. I think the idea is where it fits into the pattern of prior accepted practices, like in spy exchanges. And you know, uh, I was approached as U.S. attorney, uh, you know, as to what our position would be uh, in connection with those, and it's not been made public. But you know, I obviously I, I agreed with the position, and we were supportive of it. But the Hawk Bank is really an entirely different situation. First of all, uh, we had uh, Bill Barr in a meeting with me, and this was the really the you know a point of, of major uh, confrontation uh, where we were in a meeting and he was pushing for there to be secret non-prosecution agreements provided to officials of Hawk Bank and to Turkish government officials in connection with this kind of global settlement. Which is, as you point out in the book, exactly the kind of bargain that was made in Florida with Jeffrey Epstein, in which part of the plea deal was kept secret from the public. And from the victims, most importantly. And it was an abomination. that, Ep And we were, when I had that conversation with Bill Barr in his office, and I told him that entering into a non secret non-prosecution agreements with these individuals would be a fraud on the court. I knew two weeks later, we were probably going to be arresting Jeffrey Epstein as he landed at Teterboro Airport, and that we wouldn't have ever had to have arrested him if that non-prosecution deal was rejected by Acosta, who was U.S. attorney at the time in the Southern District of Florida. So that, that differentiates the Hawk Bank, the extreme measures that Barr and others were willing to go to, to protect the bank and Turkish officials. And it was never explained why we were giving this kind of preferential treatment ever. So in the other cases you describe, there's a reason, right? You, you can see why it's important for you to take action. That was never explained to us. I'm interested in your sense of the institutional damage here. I can, I can make an argument that what they did greatly normalizes the idea of using law enforcement to protect your friends and, and go after your enemies. I can also make the argument 
convert in the other direction that the fact that SDNY actually didn't buckle in any of these instances uh, makes it much less likely that a subsequent attorney general is going to lock horns with a U.S. attorney from the Southern District, uh, and that it provides a model for the way other U.S. attorneys might behave. Now, in some cases, that's the U.S. attorney's offices are of of not as high quality, and so there's a there's a a, a greater function oversight function from from main justice but leave that aside what's the lesson that people are going to take from this book institutionally is it the is it kind of don't mess with sdny we really are an independent entity or is it try harder next time no no i it's it's not you know don't mess with the sdny the the the, the lesson is how very fragile our justice system is. That's the lesson. And the reason that I wrote the book is so people understand the full extent of the political interferences and how close we came to having these kind of cases dictated not by an unbiased Department of Justice, but by a president who was using the Department of Justice as his own personal law firm and pulling the levers of government in order to gain power, maintain power, and for his own uh, aggrandizement. That's what's so scary. And and it, it bothers me that there could be another attorney general in the future who not only uh, tries to impede with the SDNY, but all the other districts. It's, it's equally as damaging. And so the, the reason I, I, I wrote the book is to shed light on it to allow there to be transparency. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm very heartened by and I welcome the uh, investigation initiated by the Senate Judiciary Committee into the instances I've identified in the book. I think that uh, that's going to be an additional light on this uh, and, and provide additional transparency that hopefully will in the future make something like this more difficult to happen. So I want to ask you about two people who have because of the January 6th committee had a kind of real moment in the sun uh, who you take a little bit of the, take a little bit of sandpaper to the luster that they've acquired. And those are Jeffrey Rosen and uh, Richard Donahue. Um, Rosen, of course, being the deputy attorney general under Barr and Donahue being uh, your counterpart in the Eastern district of New York, who was then the sort of acting deputy when when Rosen was uh, acting attorney general after Barr left. And uh, both of these men uh, gave very, I thought, quite impressive testimony in the January 6th matter. Both uh, describe uh, in great detail the uh, machinations of their uh, underling, Jeffrey Clark, who, of course, was then in the position that you were offered, the head of the civil division. And yet, uh, so both of them have, uh, in the last few months, had real sort of moments in the sun as kind of honorable people within the Justice Department. Uh, You describe a less flattering side of both of them one of whom you uh, Donahue you describe as brilliant but willing to go along with the politicization uh, under Barr, and the other one Rosen, you kind of question his competence, and so I'm I'm interested in your sense of them in light of the January sixth testimonies. Is this an example of we shouldn't we should judge everybody from what they did before? Uh, the election, not after, or is this an example of people being complicated? No, I, I think it, it it's an example of, of judging people by what happened before Trump lost the election. So with respect to um, uh, to Rosen, Jeffrey Rosen, I, I, I didn't challenge his, his competence as a lawyer. He just came into the job with zero experience in the Department of Justice. Can you imagine that? appointing a deputy attorney general, basically running the day-to-day operations of the Department of Justice. 
with no experience in the Department of Justice. And he, uh, he interfered in our office, I relay in the case, when uh, Trump, you know, once again was using the Department of Justice as his own personal law firm, and I think Barr was calling the shots on this, by uh, wanting to require the Southern District of New York to sign briefs supporting the president's effort to quash the subpoena for his tax returns that was submitted to his tax preparer. And we thought the brief just wasn't sustainable. We thought the arguments made no sense. And I didn't want any part of that brief, and I didn't want our name on that brief. And so I instructed our people to get our name off the brief. And I got a call back from Rosen's deputy who said, uh, you don't understand, Jeff. Uh, this is a directive from Jeffrey Rosen that your name stays on that brief. And they only wanted our name on the brief because of, of the imprimatur of the Southern District of New York in the, with the judges of the Southern District and judges of the Second Circuit. You know, if our name is on a brief, that carries some weight. And more importantly, if your name is not on the brief, it suggests, in this case correctly, that SDNY, which has a bit of a trust relationship with those courts, has a problem with it. That's right. And so uh, I wanted our name off the brief. And, and, and I had a, a very tense call with uh, Jeff Rosen. And he said, no, your name is on. We have control over the filing and your name is staying on the brief. And I said, you know, Mr. Deputy Attorney General, if you file that brief with the SDNY name on it, you will compel me to send a letter to the Second Circuit saying we don't subscribe to these views. And it was only when I said that that he backed off. In fact, I, I had with me the ethics officer of the Southern District of New York, and I said, look, I have no, I have no choice. I am instructed by my ethics officer that I would have to send that letter to the court. And that's something I knew that would be completely unacceptable to him. And afterwards, uh, my ethics officer said, you know, he didn't like being used as a human shield, but <laughs> um, it was effective. And, and our name came off the brief. And you know why I wasn't fired? Because the, the, the directive term is a term that was used several times when Barr took over. And it's meant to indicate that, you know, uh, this is not discretionary. Uh, this is not a request. This is a directive. And if you disobey a, a directive, you know, you could get fired. But I was, I was willing to take that risk with respect to the, uh, the brief that was being filed because coincidentally, that very day, we had just announced the indictment of Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, who were Giuliani's associates. And I knew that if they, they would never fire me that day or in the proximity to that, because it would be viewed as a kind of a payback for bringing that case. So I was in a way protected by this other case that we were dealing with. Speaking of Rudy Giuliani, uh, you are, if only briefly, a former law partner of, of Giuliani's at, at Greenberg Trorig. And you describe in this, in the book, a I, I suppose an incident that won't, will not surprise his many detractors, but suggests that his uh, the the problems that were on floridly on display in the election and post election period actually go back a ways. How well do you know Giuliani, and how do you regard him at this point? Uh, you know, I don't really know Giuliani. I didn't know him before he, he came to Greenberg Trarg, and I met him, I guess, less than a handful of times when he was at Greenberg Trarg, but I did, you know, take him to this client dinner, you know, what's known as cross-selling at a law firm, and it was, the, the dinner was a complete train wreck. He was completely unhinged. You know, he started drinking during the cocktail hour, continued drinking during dinner, and uh, it was a disaster uh, of an evening. Um, so I, I, I don't know him, and um, I, I have no explanation for his conduct over the past several years. I'm interested, you describe 
uh, as have a number of your predecessors in this office. It's the way Jim Comey talks about the office. It's the way Preet talks about the office as a forging ground for all kinds of collaborative work in government, as a very serious place with very serious people who expect a degree of independence. And over a long period of time in the book, you describe consulting with two former occupants of the office, one Republican, Robert Fisk, and one Democrat, Mary Jo White. And so I'm I'm just interested in your sense of the the camaraderie of the people who have been U.S. attorneys for SDNY. I note that you, I, I mean, obviously, with the, the exception of Giuliani, um, who served in that office in the 80s, um, you really do, uh, don't have a word of criticism for any of your predecessors. And I, I, I'm interested why the office in your view, has kind of created that culture that's not merely nonpartisan at the line and and deputy and career level, but even among the political appointees who run it, that, you know, you, you're a lot closer to Mary Jo White and uh, Robert Fisk than you are to Donahue and Rosen and Bill Barr. What is the magic of the SDNY office that holds that kind of esprit de corps together across party, even at the political appointee level? Well, uh, I wish I could bottle it. it. It's an extraordinary place. It's filled with 220 of the most brilliant, dedicated, hardworking public servants in the country, all moving in the same direction. It's really the working as one team and pitching in. And I was lucky enough to be there as a, a AUSA in the early 1990s where, you know, I learned to do things as everyone does the Southern District way with professionalism, thoroughness, independent, fairness, and always seeking to do justice without fear or favor and abiding by the cardinal rule. You leave your politics at the door that partisan political concerns don't enter into any decision-making. And it's extraordinary because of the people there. The history is extraordinary. The prior leaders are legendary. And I was lucky enough to have two mentors, uh, Bob Fisk, when I I was a first-year associate at Davis Polk, uh, when I met uh, Bob Fisk, who was the senior partner there, and got a chance to work with him. And it was extraordinary. And he's been a a great supporter of mine. I'm so grateful and a mentor of mine. And Mary Jo White, I was in AUSA under Mary Jo White. And again, you know, I really have to thank her for her extraordinary mentorship and friendship. And, and they guided me through much of this process. Obviously, I couldn't share anything of the specifics of what was going on in the office, right? Because the confidential information in the Department of Justice stays there. But they, but they, they get, did give me great guidance. And, and it's an extraordinary place. I mean, as you noted, half the book is about the interference by Maine Justice Department, and half the book is a love letter to the Southern District of New York. The book is holding the line inside the nation's preeminent U.S. attorney's office and its battle with the Trump Justice Department. The author is the former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, Jeffrey Berman. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode is the intrepid Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Hey, folks, are you a material supporter of Lawfare yet? If not, why not? And when are you going to fix it? Go to patreon.com slash lawfare and sign up. You get an ad-free version of this podcast. You get to take Scott Shapiro's hacking class live. You get all kinds of other stuff. And most importantly, you get to know that you are making content like this possible. The Lawfare Podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. 
And as always, thanks for listening.